Binanchi. Binanchi, did I pronounce that right? Yes. It's yes. A, it's a word my sister Gwen used to make up words. And <laughs> she came up with this word. I don't know where she got it from. When we were kids. And she'd see someone, and if they didn't look the way she thought they should should look, she would say they would be nouncy. <laughs> I love those made-up words. Those become wonderful things, like ARP. Anyway, um, <laughs> I am so happy to introduce everyone today to Don Lewis. I know a lot of you know him already, um, but I... Uh, I'm so honored. He, I consider him a friend, and he is also a board member of the Alan R. Perlman Foundation, a musician, a visionary, an educator, a complete inspiration, and a delight to hang out with. And we share the same birthday, so of course, we're just fantastic Aries, right? <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Aries. Have to get that in there. Okay. Um, so today's program uh, is going to be similar to what we did before. We're going to ask you some questions. We're going to take a look at some equipment, ask a few more questions, but there's some a little extra exciting stuff at the end of today's broadcast. So definitely stick around. Um, I want to say that I first met Don in person that I remember, of course, because I was a kid when I was going to NAM. I met him November of 2015 at the Everything Art Symposium at Berkeley College of Music. And it was a really magical, magical day. And it was such a delight to not only meet him, but start to learn about his history. Because some, I, I don't know if that was what led to the documentary later, but there was a lot of wonderful historical photos and music and just a whole plethora of fantastic synthesizer stuff. So if everyone is ready, I am going to go ahead and have Don take over as far as the screen is concerned. There we go. All righty. Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions and if everyone will be able to chime in later on in the broadcast. Uh, I would like you to tell us, because not all of us know, uh, what actually led to your interest in music and from there to synthesizers. Oh my. How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll get the synopsis version of this. So. <laughs> well, anyway, um, starting out when I was just a little kid, um, my folks hung out at church a lot. And so I, I listened to a lot of church music um, in a Baptist church. My grandmother was a, was a um, choir director and my mom sang in her choir. But my mom was a little, um, she had a, a little bit more, um, should I say, inquisitiveness about exploring other music. And I remember on Saturdays when I was maybe four or five years old, mom would uh, turn on the radio in the afternoon and um, we would listen to the Metropolitan Opera. Mm, wonderful stuff. Here we are in Dayton, Ohio, in the projects. And mom would turn on the radio. She wouldn't turn it up as loud as she normally would when she was playing other kind of music because she didn't want the, <laughs> the neighbors to think that she was too highbrow. Uh oh. You know? <laughs> but anyway, that was that was the beginning, and I, I look forward to those uh, those Saturdays when we would um, we sit there and oh, listen to the radio, and and then of course on Sunday. It was church all day, music all day, choir singing, and my grandmother was pretty innovative in her time. Back in the early 50s, she started a, 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 actually a, a youth band there at our church, and all the kids that were playing musical instruments, you know, when you had music in the schools, uh, in public schools, and and the kids had these instruments, but they didn't do anything with them on Sunday. So she said, "I think they they know how to play them. So we, let's let's teach them some songs they can play." So I ended up playing in that um, organization. I first my first instrument I played was the ukulele. Ukulele. And you teach and, and you teach ukulele now. I saw a little glimpse of a. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it was, it was really that time um, 
where I started thinking about how to ch- take that information I was learning on the uke and move it over and use it on the piano. Um, because ukulele actually taught you chord progressions and relationships and things you would never get with piano lessons at the very beginning. And then um, there was an organist at our church that this is my transition from from uh, the ukulele to, to um, keyboards. There was an organist at our church who played the organ, uh, Ulysses Rivers, and I loved the way he played the organ. And I would sit after... Uh, uh, right behind him uh, as he played the organ. And I remember one day just thinking that I was, I, I, I wanted to learn how to play this organ. And one night I had this dream, and the dream basically, I was playing the organ, not Ulysses. And so that was something that really inspired me. Move forward, um, in, in high school, I studied electronics. We had an electronics course that was offered in our high school, Paul Ernst Dunbar High School in Dayton, Ohio. And um, there, I, my science and my math came together, and we built things with science and math uh, radios, uh, AM radio, FM radio, and then finally a TV. And uh, that sparked my, my mind. By this time, you know, uh, high fidelity was coming in and stereo was coming in and we knew how to build those those circuits because of the uh, information and education we got with that electronics course. And so as I was doing it, as we were building that television, I was thinking about maybe I could build an electronic organ. Hmm. And that was in the back of my mind. And that didn't happen until much later. But that's how I got started. Um, I was um, mostly self-taught in the fact of my musical explorations. I had um, two, actually three piano teachers, one right right after the other. And I had an organ teacher uh, who taught me to play uh, pedals, you know, and and the organ and registration and all those things that go along with that. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking that this was orchestration that I was listening to when I was lis- uh, listening to the Metropolitan Opera. Wow, that's quite diverse. I know, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's that's something you've been doing a lot all along. Um, how did you go from organs to synthesizers, and more specifically, how did you start to get involved with uh, ARP synthesizers? Well, the, the synthesizer bug hit, hit me as soon as Swiss Drum Bach came out. Uh. Uh, yeah, Walter, Walter, Wendy, Carlos. And uh, when I heard that, that sound, it, was, it, just, it just went all through me. It was like, oh, my gosh. And, and she was playing some of my favorite music, you know, uh, you. Bach. Um, and I loved that. It was just... Okay. I mean, she was kicking it. <laughs> so the then, organ music, the organ music, Bach organ music, I didn't even yeah, hear that. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I had to play a few of those things when I was first learning how to play the organ. Nothing as fancy as what she was doing, uh, but but it was still those little preludes and things like that. Um, and when I heard that, and then after I got the album and I uh, <laughs> read that, it took her two years to do that in the studio, I says I can't wait that long. I want to do that live. Yeah. So that was that. That was my bed. That was my foundation for wanting to explore that that whole situation. And um, and when I got, I started working with the Hammond Organ Company. Um, this is 1969 at the uh, Nam Show. Hammond asked me to come and play uh, at X77. Have an organ. It was one of the, their latest one, and um, of course I modified my the organ too. I did some things strangely to it, and um, but uh, at the same time I was thinking, my goodness, 
this organ thing, and the, and and then there was the guy that I met when I do a, did a tour for Hammond up in uh, Northeast, um, actually in the Boston area, Paul Pittman. Paul Pittman became, uh, at one time, was the national sales manager for ARP. He, before that, was a representative for Hammond. And he, he joined the ARP team, called me up, and we were very good friends. I used to uh, tour his territory. And uh, so he called me up and told me what he was doing. And he knew I was interested in synthesizers. And so he is the one that introduced me to your father and to I, um, the president at that time, Marvin. Marvin Cohen, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. And then uh, uh, David Friend, um, and then Dave Fredericks, you know, and my, Mike Brigida, I met the, the next, I think it was next year, but in 1972 was the year that I demonstrated the ARP 2600 with a Hammond organ uh, there at, at the um, uh, NAMM show. We were in the Conrad Hilton Hotel, the Haymarket. Yeah. And you might have seen some, uh, some of the photos there. And the next year, um, after that, everybody was excited about what had happened. And the next year, we decided to have three players play and I happened to be a, one of the people in there. There was Dave Fredericks, and then there was Mike Brigida. And we, we, we were so into this whole situation. Uh, of course, with my background in, in uh, electronics and thinking about sound, how were we going to get these synthesizers to sound the way we wanted them to? Mm -hmm. Remember, in those days, they didn't have these wide range uh, dynamic range speakers. You had, either had a bass speaker or you had a guitar speaker. That was it, as far as the um, as far as live playing. And so we had special speakers made up. A company called RTR built, built these speakers from uh, uh, Canoga Park, California, and uh, we had these speakers built, and they had 19 drivers in each speaker. We had stereo pairs, and these things set up. You'll see them later on when we go into the uh, right. to see. And that was that was man. That was we thought we we that was the Nam Jam. That's what we <laughs> jam, jam. Yeah. And we even had little little jars of of jam with labels on it that said the Art Nam Jam. <laughs> I heard about those. I heard about those. There's something on, we're, we're not going to find on eBay, though, right? No. <laughs> 40, 40-year-old 40, 40 Nam Jam. <laughs> Fredericks who came up with that. I don't know where. He must have been in the jam or something. <laughs> he loved We loved it. So I've seen pictures and I've heard recordings. What was it like? What was it like to be seeing the audience react to what you were doing? This is so new. This stuff was so new. What was the energy like? You know, I don't know if ever in my life I had seen such an experimental, um, joyous exploration of, of what sound was. It wasn't really about sitting down playing somebody's tune. It was about exploring the sounds that you could. I mean, of course, you would do a few tunes that people would know, but I think it was probably for me one of the most uh, a high point. One of the highest points was the exploration of sound um, and having these instruments that, <laughs> in another lifetime, I earlier that I used to sit down and do test equipment with what we call signal generators, function generators that had sawtooth waveforms and so forth. And I'm doing, using those to test out equipment. Uh, but to have that now being under my fingertips where I'm actually making sounds coming out of a keyboard, that was, for me, was just like, Wee! <laughs> it was crazy good. And um, I think it's, it's, I think the fact that playing around with sound is like 
playing well you're playing with vibrations and you know my whole my whole mantra has been that you know everything is built on on, uh, on vibrations you know I got this book up here uh, Einstein's book up there <clears throat> and you know he talks they're, they're talking about the string theory and the whole the whole thing and a string is is this little wiggle and what sound is and what synthesizers are about is the control of that wiggle and it, that wiggle is the foundation of the universe. Wow. Okay. And so when you look at that and you start to say, oh, I just, I just, I don't care if you play a whole bunch of music, just experiment with it. Some people will do, you know, some people will take it to the next degree and, and all the symphonies that we have and all the different kinds of music that we have now, everybody's doing their own little thing, making their own little wiggle doing their own little dance. And when people are sitting down and playing with the synthesizer, I think that's the reason it, the, especially the analog synthesizer has come back into full uh, recognition uh, of the kids want to just turn it down the knobs and, and listen to it and see what it sounds like. What do you think about that pendulum, the, the, the pendulum that is swung back from, it's sort of a question that we were, I was going to cover later, but going from digital and especially someone who was so involved in MIDI and now everyone's into analog again. It's the gear. It's in, what do you think about that? I think people want to, I, uh, for, for one thing, I think people want to feel things. Yes. Um, you know, th th there's a reason we have these hands. And the hands are, are really a part of our exploratory uh, attribute. And synthesizers, for the most part, especially the analog, have a smoother resolution than digital. Digital, you still got to jump from one point to another. I don't care how, far, how, how close you make those points, what the resolution is. But in analog, it's just it's a very smooth transition. And I think our ears, the way we're wired up, I mean, we don't normally, let's see, somebody's got spasm or something, but we normally move like that. We're analog people. I mean, th this is a part of our anatomy. This is a part of our nature. Everything is sort of moved like this. When we move it into another realm, like with electronics and now with digital, then we're trying to replicate that, but it is not quite the same. It's not going to make that much difference if you don't know what you're doing or you don't want it, you don't even care about it. But I think it's pleasing to the sound, uh, to the ear. The sound is pleasing to the ear. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's one of, the, one of the reasons. You got more knobs and things you can twiddle with. Instead of having a little LED um, or touch, even a touch screen is nearly as sensitive or as adaptable to, to the fingers. As, as, as having a, a surface that you can actually turn. There is something magical, I think, about the hand-eye coordination that taps a yeah. part of our brain. Well, it's why mm -hmm. I'm writing notes, I mean, I still write notes, you know, uh, and it's somewhere, somehow it just becomes in, in, more internalized somehow. It becomes, it's the synapses, and you probably know a lot more about this being a scientist. Well, I don't know if I'm a scientist, but I, I, I like science. Um, one of the things that, you know, when I built Leo, um, it might have been in my mind, but it wasn't until I sat down and took a pencil and paper and a triangle and a square, <laughs> T-square, and drew out the plans. That's the same thing as sitting there, you know, writing something and drew out the plans for, for Leo, that it became a, a, a path. It, it became a, a roadmap so that I could develop and to actually realize this later. It wasn't until I did that planning. And so I think when you sit and you tur you're turning knobs on things, sometimes you don't even know where, where that's going to take you. Uh, and the way you patched up with with the old synthesizer where you could take the oscillator and run it over here, you could run it here, or take filter and have, let it do something else. 
all of these pathways, and everybody has a different way they can do it. And it's experimental. It's it's inquisitive. I mean, it's it's what we are. That's why we have these senses. We're here basically to uh, explore. We're explorers. Whether or not most of us figure that out or not, but I believe that's what we're here. We're here to co-create. Ah, oh, that's great. I love that. Um, so uh, before we go further, I understand that we're at, uh, this is your studio now, but you have a, a Leo located somewhere else in the house. Can we take a look and you can tell us a little <laughs> bit about it? Yes. Uh, we're, we're going to be moving to what my wife calls the organ donor roof. roof. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the kitchen. Here's the front. And now, here's the or or organ donor row. <laughs> the X77, which got me my first job with Hammond. <laughs> and this is the Rogers W5000. I worked on it later, which is a company that uh, Roland bought back in 88. <clears throat> and here is Leo. Oh, wow. All right. So for those people who don't know the story, tell us about how you decided to create Leo. What was your inspiration? <laughs> Wendy Carlos. Wendy Carlos. Yes. Well, she did switched on Bach and had, it took her two years. I wanted to be able to play switched on Bach or something like that or synthesize her sounds real time. So, because I was playing in places like nightclubs and Carnegie Hall and places like that where people don't expect you to sit there for hours and twiddle with knobs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we want to explore this this uh, Leo here, our my friend. Oh, what you're listening to right now is this synthesizer here, which is a Pro Mars that I have in fact connected to. The bass pedals down here. Right underneath it is um, JP4. And these are things that, that were ancillary to, to, uh, <laughs> to Leo before we got, before after we got all this together and all this stuff came out and had to integrate it with this, never got it into a case. I probably would put that in plexiglass if I had time, okay? And underneath is a uh, TR-808, so we're going to get our, our rhythm from that.
these are the 26 bundles right here. gosh what a treat what a treat ah oh, so wow <laughs> what the thing? You, you exude so much joy when you play it is just a treat to the whole experience is just absolutely amazing um so uh you know the leo was uh really ahead of its time and during this uh, progression you have with electronic music, you work with some amazing folks, both in the uh, instrument building, synthesizer building instrument, and uh, the uh, recording industry. So what was it like What is uh, to work with Kakahashi, for instance? What an amazing man and what an amazing collaboration. Tell us about it. Okay, well, I'm going back again to 1969 and in Chicago at the NAMM show, and my first time going to the NAMM show playing for the Hammond Organ Company, and I had, on the X77, I had a rhythm ace made by Ace Tone that Mr. Kakehashi was then the president of Ace Tone. And I had modified that unit because I wanted to have different rhythms than the ones that were there. Um, and so I went inside and I changed those sounds. And so when I did my uh, presentation at, with Hammond at the NAMM show, Mr. Kagehashi happened to be sitting in the audience. And I didn't know who he was or anything. And I did my, my uh, presentation and he came up afterwards and he says, Ah, oh, he introduced himself. Oh, ah, oh, looks like my rhythm machine, but doesn't sound like it. What did you do to it? And so I said, oh, I always have my little uh, toolkit with me. So I opened it up and I showed him all the modifications I had. I had diodes and rewired the switches and so forth. And we became instant friends over that. And from then on, it wasn't a time that he ever came to the United States that he didn't stop by where I was living. And, uh, and we would sit down and have, uh, you know, he would have coffee or, or actually he was drinking then, Coca-Cola. <laughs> he would always have Coca-Cola. We go to a restaurant and we sit down with napkins and draw circuits. That was our conversation. <laughs> and we would have, and he was a funny guy. I mean, he was really great. His English seemed to be very broken, but his humor, his puns, the things that he would do with the English language that I never heard anybody do and have us all busting up. He was my big brother. He was my big brother. And we became friends then. And then that was in 1969. In 1971, he invited me to come to Japan oh, wow. and, and to do a, a tour. The company that he had at the time was 
um, Ace Tone, it was also a sub um, subsidiary of a company that was the importer for the Hammond Organ Company. So it was a, I mean, it was like made in heaven yeah. to those. Okay. And so I went there, and I, um, and my first time out of the country, and Japan was just, uh, Japanese people were just uh, so warm, and I had just wonderful time. It became my second home, I, I, if I looked at a place. Um, and working with the engineers and all that time, it was just really the greatest experience that one could have. He, he's a dear friend. His family still is um, on, it's still family to me. Mm. And now thinking about uh, the next thing, the reason I came to California was because I wanted to work with Quincy Jones. I didn't have a telephone number, didn't know his agent or anything. I just got in my van and drove to California with my synthesizer in, my 2R2600s two uh, and my soloist. <laughs> And I came to California, and at that time, that was in 1974. And that time, um, everybody was interested in synthesizer. Everybody on the pop, especially in the pop market, everybody wanted to know how, 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 how do you work these things. So I came and found the people. They found me, and, and, um, and one of the guys that I met, uh, his name is Armin Pacetta. And Armin actually built this. This top keyboard right here was designed by Armin. And here is the microprocessor <laughs> right here. This is 1975. This is 1975. This is a microprocessor that actually um, takes four four different sounds. You had four note polyphony, and we were taking that sound and uh, taking this control and and actually going to each one of those notes. We're going to this one, this overheim, this overheim, this one, two, three, four, and then there are two 2600s. I'm sorry, two 2600s right here, one on top and one down on the bottom, and it was controlling those. And Armin actually uh, was working at the record plant in L.A. And he said, Quincy Jones wants to hear what you're doing. Wow. So I said, okay. So we brought, it, we brought uh, the uh, ARPS uh, 2600s. And uh, this is before Armin, we integrate, integrated uh, Armin's keyboard. And we went there, and um, and that's where I met Quincy Jones. Yeah, you've you've worked with the, quite an assortment of people. It's pretty pretty amazing. I learned a lot while I was watching the video, which we'll talk about in a few moments. But I want to be able to open up the conversation to our viewers uh, okay. a little bit. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, some people have some uh, questions. There's a a lot of shout outs. Ned is here, Alex Ball is here, Dan is here, Steve McQuarrie, uh, uh, lots, Mary's here. <laughs> Hi, Mary. Your, your son is here. <laughs> Bruce Chakalis hey. is here, Glenn Horlock from Down Under, and we have uh, Charles, lots of the people. So start to ask some questions. Um, if you want your questions, um, just go ahead and type them in the comment area. Okay, Alex Ball, I had a feeling he would... Uh, Alex Ball, if you um, uh, don't know, he created a wonderful, made a wonderful documentary about Roland before he tackled ARP. So he wants yeah. to know, did that digital scanning keyboard predate the one Oberheim used themselves? Yes. Yes, in fact, uh, uh, Tom Oberheim was trying to hire uh, Armin uh, to, to uh, actually build him a keyboard system for the uh, for the uh, uh, SEMs, uh, Armin got these SEMs before he came out with a four voice. Uh, before Tom came out with a four voice, and uh, in fact, Armin built this keyboard and for Tonto, Tonto, uh, uh, Bob Mar Margoloff and Malcolm Cecil, uh, in their array of Moog synthesizers, 
used uh, Armin's keyboards to actually um, make those things do the polyphony that uh, was used on uh, Talking Book for Stevie Wonder. Oh, wow. Very cool. All right. More, uh, David Mash and Mary Locke say hello. Hi, uh, Mary. I, th I think Rich is in the background. I'm not sure, but I think he is. Um, anyway. Uh, any <laughs> oh, he's so happy he got that information. You have to go back and remake the another documentary now, Alex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, that, means, that means Ned's going to have a job for another 15 years. <laughs> Ah, so any more questions? Do we have some uh, questions? Let's see. Oh, and so, so, since Chase says hello, his family says hi to yours. Hey, great. That's Nathan. Yes. Hey, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no questions. Aw. They're in such awe, they don't know what to say. Oh, come on. There gotta be questions. Ned, Ned, uh, is, Ned is here with some uh, some uh, heart for all of us. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, people think. Um, uh, what are some highlights of your career, um, other than uh, the Nam Jam? And uh, tell us some. Uh, there's a there's a lot of space between then and now, so I'd love to hear more. Okay. Um, I guess. First, uh, my first time going to, to Japan, uh, and I went back probably at least every, every, every other year um, uh, to Japan. That's, that's one of them. Uh, I think playing at the Newport Jazz Festival mm. and Carnegie Hall twice uh, was, was a big deal. Um, in fact, the first time I played there, I had the 2600 with me. <laughs> if, if you can figure this, this was organ jazz night at Carnegie Hall. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, the Newport Jazz Festival. It was the first time that George Lynn had actually considered doing that. And that was uh, on, on uh, I think, um, an idea that uh, Jack R Ripperger, who was the um, marketing manager for Hammond uh, thought that would be a great thing to have all these artists. So we had six artists there. And me, well, I was the only unheard of. There was Jack, brother Jack McDuff, Wild Bill Davis, uh, Shirley Scott, and Jimmy Smith. Uh, and I was the only unheard of there. And um, it was it was really strange, <laughs> but... but uh, we only had 20 minutes, each artist only had 20 minutes to play. Well, you know, in jazz world, that you just get warmed up, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, on the first, I think uh, Jack McDuff was the first one up, and he had, a, he had a group with him, and he called the Heaton System. Brother Jack McDuff and the Heaton System. <laughs> and they were playing along, and man, they were really cooking, and all of a sudden, the organ went off. And the drummer and and the uh, uh, I think it was guitarist were, were were sitting there. They were the only ones that were still playing. They finished the song. What happened is that they had a timer on the stage, and the stagehands pulled a plug on the organ. Oh no! <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, everybody was <laughs> backstage watching what was happening. The next person that was up was. Uh, <laughs> Wild Bill Davis. And Wild Bill, I've never heard him play so fast in my whole life. Oh, no. <laughs> Got to get, get, get off the stage before something goes yeah. wrong. <laughs> um, J.H.H. Lowengard wants to know if the speakers that you mentioned in this room, RTR speakers? Yes. Okay. Uh, what Wow. And those are huge. Whoops. Oops. We gotta hang on to that. <laughs> ah, see? Now we have the we have the performance jinx. 
We're good. Hello. Hello. Can you... I'm sorry, I don't understand. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. Excellent. All right. All right. Uh, Je uh, Julie, Jeff Kellum is uh, thanking you for running the camera. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Alex, Alex seems to have another question. Um, yes. So, as you know, Ikatoro Kakahashi, did you know he was aware of the impact of his company's inventions in inspiring music that previously didn't exist? And he's 808-303-909-101? Yeah, that, the, uh, the, the TR-808 was actually a dream of mine uh, when I first met uh, Kakahashi back in 1969. And I told him, I said, every time I want a new rhythm, I have to go in and do a lot of changing of wiring and so forth. I says, I need a programmable rhythm unit. And here it is, over, here's one of them. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that. How aware was he? Right. Here's one of them right here. This is a rhythm ace. I turn this thing where you might be able to hear it. Let me get this pedal down here. The way I wired it up, wired it through the console here. So when I pop my foot. Right. Um, so Alex Ball was actually, I, we, I didn't phrase the question quite so well. Uh, was uh, Kakahashi aware of the impact of his company's inventions? I'm sorry, I didn't was, catch it. Was, was he aware? aware? Was he was aware of the, of the impact of his, of his company's impact. inventions in inspiring music that didn't exist? I, I think he was. That's the reason. He was always trying to, he was always trying to something, come up with a product. He didn't know exactly where musicians would take it. And I think that was the real magic that he had. He understood that musicians would explore. And he was looking for musicians who actually wanted to explore. Not necessarily just do the, you know, the more pedestrian way. Even though that was the milk and uh, <laughs> bread and butter, so to speak, for his company. Uh, at the very beginning, when he started rolling, especially, uh, I think all he had were rhythm units. That was one. Uh, that was the last one he made at, at Ace Tone, and the next rhythm units that he did were uh, out of Osaka. Uh, were um, were the bread and butter for him, and also the uh, guitar amplifier, the jazz chorus. No, that was butter from 1972 on up until um, they started ex expanding. And when uh, he always wanted to get into synthesizers, 
And I remember one time he came uh, to see me when I was um, uh, living in Vail, uh, Colorado, and he came, <laughs> had to had to take two flights to get there. <laughs> and, uh, and the last one was a, evidently a puddle jumper from Denver into Vail. And when he got off of that plane, he looked whiter than the snow that was on the ground. <laughs> Oh, it must have been scary for him. But uh, he was looking for a solution for building the, the keyboard, his first analog um, synthesizer. And um, he says, I'm, I'm having a hard time trying to figure out how to make a track. And I told him, I says, oh, well, man, I, this, this shouldn't be that hard. Uh, so we sat down and we worked out some ideas. He took them back to Japan. And, it's, and then about a two two months later, he said, "Well, we figured it out." <laughs> so so uh, that's how we started with that. Um, then then he went from when when the digital era started to come in, some of the microprocessors started to come in. That's when he's got interested in sequencing, and he came out with his first uh, um, uh, computer sequencer. Um, uh, for for MIDI, I believe it was, um, and then of course the rhythm units they just kept coming. But it wasn't until they moved uh, into the area of digital uh, and controlling analog, which was the CR68 and the 78, and that's when you had the uh, microprocessors that were used for the sequencing, and and the sounds were be still being made analog. And then right after that, uh, I remember in the studio, we have a CR-78. Um, and I remember it had hand claps on it, but it did have a, a sound called claves. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and so I figured out a way to, to program it. So it could get these two, well, maybe three, and this little, these little ticks, and we go like that. And it sounded like it was clapped. And so he came, he, I was playing at the Hungry Tiger. And he came in and he says, ah, oh, you have, yeah, where did you get the clap sound? I said, oh, he said, did you change anything? I said, no, I just made this little, made this little sequence that made it like that on claves. He says, oh, it's so hard. Many people... By, and they don't know how to make that. <laughs> <laughs> but right after that, about, uh, I guess, pretty six months or so later, the TR-808 came out. And uh, right before that time, they, they asked me to come over uh, when they were at the breadboard stage and to look at the TR-808. And I gave them some suggestions, and we worked on, on, the, uh, on the way it looked. Uh, Kikomoto... Uh, Tadato uh, uh, Kikamoto-san was the uh, chief engineer for the 808, and uh, and they they played a joke on me, and 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 everybody, <laughs> I was I'm I'm laughing now, but I've been telling this story for a long time. They played a joke on me, and I said because the hardest thing for anybody to come up with in an analog circuit was a symbol, symbol sound. Everybody was oh. using one white noise for to try to get symbol. And so um, the joke went that they told me that one day they had come in and um, and the breadboard was sitting there. Somebody had some um, green tea, Japanese green tea, and uh, inadvertently knocked the cup over on the, on the circuit board. And the symbol sound came out. <laughs> Uh, but they didn't tell me. They said that that was for real, and so I thought it was I thought it was funny. So I told this story for years and years and years. So I found out about three four years ago. <laughs> Chico Bonasan said, "Oh, that was a big joke. That's not true." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, a couple of people are asking about Quincy Jones. Uh, so uh, 
Neil and I think Steve Macquarie. I'm wondering about which Quincy Jones productions did you play on? Was it with the Brothers Johnson? What was that like? Yeah, Brothers Johnson. Um, there were, well, actually, there were one, two. There was another one, um, and that was a sweetening session with um, um, Marvin Hamlin. Uh, that was before we did the Brothers Johnson. Um, after Armin had come up with the the um, four voice with the uh, Oberheims, uh, we were demoing because Armin wanted to sell more keyboards. <laughs> so uh, Armin wanted me to go out and and uh, he was working over at Westlake uh, Studio, and uh, so uh, Sergio Mendez was working in that studio, and so he found out that we had this gear, and he was doing some sweetening on an album called Home Cooking. And um, <laughs> so we showed him the synthesizer, and he says, oh, we have to put this on our album. Well, he was there for a couple of nights. The next night, uh, doorbell rang about, oh, must have been around 10, 10 o'clock. I went to the door, and there was Quincy Jones. And Quincy says, what you got in there? I know you must have something to open up the door. <laughs> and so I opened the door and so he came in and he said, oh man, we got to put this, we got to put this on, 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 on a project that I'm working on. And it happened to be Brother Johnson's project. So Quincy Jones uh, asked me, um, Dave Grusin and Harvey Mason to be the backup, uh, be the studio players. And that's what happened. That's how I got to work with him. Um, and it was beautiful. All right. Okay, uh, we're about getting to the end. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about the documentary, um, which uh, uh, it is just fabulous. I, I, I didn't know, uh, I didn't expect how it be, to be as fabulous it wasn't. It was really great. I think uh, you and Ned, you've all done such an amazing job. Um, and I'm very excited about it being widely available. So I understand today's a special day. <laughs> May 12th. Yes. It, now, the DVD is now available at Amazon, Target, uh, Walmart, and Fi. <laughs> Just order it. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> um, I I'd like to end our our, our time together with doing uh, just showing a trailer because it, it's just uh, fabulous and and whet everyone's appetites so they can learn more about you and your work and uh, some amazing music and uh, great photos and uh, I definitely learned a lot. It was it was it was fabulous. So um, I just want to give a shout out to Ned yes. because Ned. This was a labor of love that he did for, uh, I think, more than 15 years working on the documentary. And uh, I'm, he's, he's my, oh, my little bro. He's about seven, six. <laughs> 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 yeah. But, but uh, I just want to give him a shout out and say how much we, we love him and uh, how much it means to me that he would take this part of his life, a substantial part of his life uh, to devote, to put this um, documentary out. And I hope everyone enjoys it. It's, it's, it's an amazing story um, that he weaves. Um, and every time I see it, it's just like, oh, I, I can't believe that someone would, could look at my life in the way that he did and our lives, in fact, the way that he did and to make it such uh, an enduring and um, I think inspirational piece for all musicians. Musicians are not musicians. It's a family film. <laughs> thank you so much, Ned. And thank you, Dina. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and great joy to be with you this afternoon. Thank you. So everyone, don't go away. We're going to play the trailer. There's some information at the end you can learn about. Uh, get Oh, someone is uh, had already ordered it. Jeff Kellum. All right. So, um, all right. Without uh, any further ado, I'm going to wish everyone uh, a wonderful afternoon and evening. Stay tuned for the trailer and see you next week. Mwah. Much love.
his vision of what instruments should do is still 10 years past our ability to make them. Look at the things he invented and the things he modified. You're talking about a historic character here. He doesn't know it, but he is, <laughs> you know? Let alone putting a screwdriver and a soldering iron together to come up with this sound. And it was up to us to make the sounds that would come to market. There's all kinds of stories through history when you have the greats, the Galileos, were persecuted. And you have to really think that Don Lewis is like a Galileo. Don was a threat. He was an extraordinary danger to the Musicians' Union. I mean, the Musicians' Union at that point was hanging on for dear life. To me, it was never uh, an attempt to displace a musician, just another instrument in color in the orchestration. There were a lot of things that they insisted continued as a tradition, one of which was black musicians were listed separately than white musicians. I mean, it takes a while to, to overcome that kind of pre-programmed prejudice. He was a pioneer. His forward thinking was way beyond what most people were even dreaming of. He got it. How dynamic these sounds were and just how difficult it was to do that. Already we think how to synchronize each other. Always program, but he, he did it by himself. Thank you. Thank you.